Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just discovered this past week uh, that there are many churches in the Christian world that celebrate this Sunday after Easter as Holy Humor Sunday. The idea behind this is that we celebrate the joy of Easter and the fun stories and the joy of that. And uh, some people have said that it's like God you know, pulled the prank on Satan and rose Jesus from the dead. Perhaps you know some dad jokes to go with some Christian holy humor. Um, I'll just say one, okay? And so, um, how did Paul make his coffee? He brews. All right, let's move on from that. Uh, surprises are fun, right? The surprise of Jesus rising from the dead was so unexpected, and we need to tap into the joy of that surprise, that the tomb was empty. But I think sometimes perception of the Christian life is that it is not full of joy, but that it's boring. Have you ever run into this? This idea that, oh, Christians take themselves too seriously, right? And you would have noticed in our confession, we talked about that, right? We talked about how sometimes we take ourselves too serious, that there's no laughing in church. We must be solemn and still at all times in church. Worship is boring. You sing old hymns, right? You don't sing pop songs. You don't sing fun songs to get us moving all the time. No, you sing boring old, old songs from the 1500s. How dare you? It can be boring to sit and listen to some guy, some American, lather on and on. He finds it interesting. Do you? And all his tiresome jokes, his tiresome stories about sports, all the time it's sports this and sports that, can be very boring and disengaging. You've got to dress nice when you come to church too, right? You've got to look good, and you've got to hide your uniqueness, right? So if you have any tattoos, you better hide them, right? Make sure nobody knows that you have them. Worship, church life, can be boring. And some people even take it to the extent where they say, oh, if I come to church, I've got to have my life together as well. I better not show them my weaknesses, my scars, the faults, the emotions that I have. Better not laugh, better not cry at church. I better be quiet and still and listen and be a good boy like I had to maybe when I was a little lad. And so we miss out, I think, on the joy of the Lord when we have this mindset. And I think that's certainly an outside perspective, but I think there is some truth to the reality of that at times in our lives, that maybe we take ourselves too serious and we don't have a bit of joy of the Lord. And there was joy in the Lord, certainly, in the Bible. I think of this story of David. When they found the Ark of the Covenant, it says that wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might while he and Israel were bringing up the Ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of triumphs. He was dancing. He was full of the joy of the Lord. And as the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when he saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Sometimes that happens in church, doesn't it? Sometimes that happens in our Christian life. Those who have found the joy of the Lord, maybe they're a new convert, and, and are so excited, they want to talk about it all the time, and we go, oh, this is exhausting. But they're so full of the joy of the Lord. Maybe it happens in worship. Here in church, we don't often express our worship in that way, with dancing or with arms or a movement or any of that. But I've certainly been to churches like that. Maybe you have too. I remember one guy just had that full dance, that full joy of the Lord, and it was distracting. I was probably a bit like this woman. And I was displeased. I was frustrated. I was being distracted from worship because of the way this person was expressing their joy of the Lord. It's easy to fall into that. But listen to what David said. David said to Michal, 
it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house, and he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. I'll go to the furthest extent. Become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by those slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. That is to say, he's going to keep going. He's never going to be ashamed of the joy that he has in the Lord. And at times, it's going to embarrass him. It's going to humiliate him, this joy in the Lord, this life in the Lord. But those, some will see that as great honor and see past the frustration and see what it really is. And the truth is, we shouldn't have to hide the joy of the Lord in our worship, in our lives. We shouldn't have to hold that back. We should be able to express it. But at the same time, and this is important, we balance this. We also shouldn't hide the hurt we have. Because we're not always full of the joy of the Lord. Amen? See, you can respond like that. Yeah, yeah. Full of joy of the Lord. Well, amen. We shouldn't have to hide the hurt we have. Just like we shouldn't have to hide the joy we have. The hurt we have, that things aren't going the way we want them, that the joy of the Lord isn't full in our lives because we're struggling to pay the bills, because uh, we're not living where we want to. Our kids aren't doing what we'd like them to do. Our grandkids, we don't have as much time as we want with them. Some of you are weeping and mourning over that. Some of you are celebrating those relationships. Some of you are going back and forth between those, right? We, as, as a church, need to have room for all those expressions of emotion, of joy, and of hurt, of mourning. It's not so easy in those times of mourning. There's a worship song back in the 90s, I remember. You may be sung it here, I'm Trading My Sorrows. Does anybody remember that song? The song goes, I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Right? And if only it was that easy, right? If only it was that easy that you could just say, I'm trading my sorrows, Lord. Here, take my sorrows. Here, take my shame. And we say that, but... But each and every day of life in Christ is not so easy. We don't always have the joy of the Lord. And I think where this song gets it wrong is the person who's doing it. Right? I'm trading my song. I'm the one who's got to do it. Instead, we read from Psalms. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. That my heart may sing your praise and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. You see, it's not up to us to trade our sorrows. It's not up to us to move from hurt and pain to joy in the Lord. Because it can be difficult to turn sorrow into joy when it's all on us. And so I want us to go back to the resurrection story, to that Easter Sunday, to remember what Jesus promises he will do. And so while we heard about, Matthew, or about Thomas, I want to hear again about Mary. So I'll read it for you. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot, and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him, and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Mary. It wasn't Mary who figured it out. In fact, Mary was oblivious to the fact that it was even Jesus. She was still stuck in her grief, in her mourning that Jesus had died. And when Jesus is right in front of her, he, she still couldn't figure it out. We can't figure it out, this life in Christ. We can't trade our sorrows. We can't pretend to have joy in the Lord. We can't do it ourselves. Everything changes when what happens? When Jesus speaks her name. Jesus says, Mary, and bing, it happens. It's Jesus who calls out to her. It's Jesus who speaks her name. 
It's Jesus who opens her eyes and says, here I am in the flesh before you, resurrected. Jesus speaks your name as well. In the waters of baptism, Jesus says, you are mine. You are a child of God. You. And he speaks your name. And like that, you see Jesus for who he is, your risen Lord and Savior. And he's the one who takes your sorrow, takes your pain, takes your hurt, and turns it into joy, turns it into dancing, turns it into life with him forever. It's Jesus who does this, not us. And we walk in that life and in that faith. And so Christian life is, is this. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and we mourn with those who mourn. Because while Jesus calls us by name, we can rejoice in that, in that resurrection life. We also know we're not there yet. And there is still plenty to mourn, plenty to be sad about here in our church. But we do it together. You are never alone in your hurt. And you're never alone in your joy as well. I love hearing today as people came in the, the joy of new grandchildren but also the morning of cancer. It's all here in this building right now, and we do it together as his church. Because Jesus speaks our name, because the Christian life is living in resurrection joy, the now and the not yet, the here and the yet to come. And so we rejoice today. We have a laugh, we have a bit of joy, but we also mourn and cry together because Jesus has spoken our name and gives us life forever. Amen? Amen.